Hi, so today we're starting a new module on self-regulation and we're also going to cover growth mindset theory today. So what is self-regulation? Um, self so our guiding questions today are what are the models? Um, how does it apply to classroom practice? How um, is self-regulation related to growth mindset and what research is, supports growth mindset? So self-regulation um, refers to learning that's guided by metacognition. And that's a really big word that just means thinking about your own thinking and being able to control and monitor that thinking. Um, strategic action, which is the monitoring of the thinking, evaluating your progress against standard, um, and your motivation to learn. So um, self-regulation is our processes of this. And we've already talked quite a bit about motivation. So thinking about how what controls that motivation and what controls our ability to overcome motivation, perhaps. Um, so self-regulated describes the process of taking control and evaluating your own learning and behavior. So as teachers, we are trying to, um, to teach these processes of self-regulation and, and grow self-regulated learners who can be successful in the workplace in future coursework um, in their school and academic careers. So we're going to look at several models of self-regulated learning, um, which has, which this is really a field that's grown a lot in the last um, 20 years or so. We're going to look at Zimmerman's sociocognitive perspectives, Bocart's dual processing model, Lynn Hodwin's metacognitive SRL model, Hendrick's motivational model, Elkhide's metacognitive and affective model, and Hadwin, Jarvella's, and Miller's socially, socially shared regulated learning model. And that sounds like a lot, um, but and then really these models um, really interact with each other, build on each other, and again, look at self-regulated learning from different perspectives. Um, so let's look at Zimmerman's model, um, which is a socio-cognitive perspective, or at least cyclical model. Um, we have the performance phase, um, which is the self-observation, self-control phase. And then we have um, where we're looking at task strategies, help seeking, um, time management, interest, incentives, self-consequences, metacognition, and self-reporting. This is where we're doing things. Um, then we have this, this is when we're doing the act of self-regulation. Um, then we have the self-reflection phase. This is where we are um, thinking about how well we were able to regulate ourselves. Um, we're evaluating, we're deciding if it, that causal attribution, the locus of control, um, was this um, something we could have controlled better or was this something that was a luck or our teacher? Um, were we satisfied, or were we satisfied, um, were we, um, do we have an adaptive or defensive response? Um, should we, and then that leads us to, um, our fourth thought phase, before we go into the performance phase, thinking about our goal planning, our strategic planning, and as we evaluate ourselves, we might be planning for the future. Um, and do we think that we will be um, successful in the future? Our, our expectancy value, our self-efficacy, our task value, our goal orientation, what are our goals? Um, are they performance-based or are they, um, or, uh, yeah. Are they performance-based goals? Are they about um, trying to reduce our risk? So on all of these work together, so as I set goals, then I can um, do some more self-regulation, which would lead me to more self-reflection, which would lead me to more forethought, and they and these all go, um, these are all reciprocal. So this is, this is really the simple, one of the simpler models of self-regulation. I think it makes a lot of sense, and as we start thinking about regulation of, um, of our own thought processes. Um, Bocart's dual processing model really thinks about um, the difference between affect, affective goals and motivational goals um, and our cognitive goals um, and our use strategies. So um, we start off with this growth pathway and we use these metacognitive deep thinking strategies when we um, when we feel like our goals are being triggered and that we have to motivate ourselves outside of a sense of well-being. Um, and we have the well-being pathway when our goals and our, um, and our needs are met, when we're amplifying our confidence, when we feel like we're going to be successful, when um, we're doing something that is fulfilling. Um, so, we, so we have this task that we're doing 
beginning, we go through an appraisal phase and we decide if this goal is either something that we feel good about doing, we have lots of self-advocacy for, in which case we have motivational beliefs that we're going to do well in this. We have self-advocacy and we're going to keep being motivated to do this and we go back to doing the work. Um, or we feel like, wow, um, I'm not being very successful at this, or this is something I haven't been successful in the past, and I'm going to have to um, motivate myself in other ways in order to do this task, or I will not do this task. I'm in this growth pathway. And I think the key part of this, um, this is driven by my needs, growth, and personal values. It's a top-down pathway. This one is a bottom-up pathway. I'm doing this strategy to prevent being damaged, to prevent a mismatch between my personal goals and my task goals. So I might not be motivated to do well in math. I might have experienced a lot of, um, you know, a lot of failure in math, but I need to to have some sort of strategy to, pre to preserve my sense of self-worth. Um, but then, but then I can switch between these two growth and well-being pathways. I might start off in the growth pathway and go to the well-being pathway. I might start in the well-being pathway and go to the growth pathway throughout the task. And that's guided by our emotions um, and how I'm feeling about the task. I think this pathway, I think that this really, this Bocart's model is really thinking about the difference between our emotions, our affect, and our cognitive use of metacognitive strategies. Um, what in Hodwin's model um, of metacognitive SRL model is really looking at this from an information processing um, model, and you can kind of see that influence in how this, in this, the way this looks, right? I'm going to move my my picture here a little bit so you can see where it says external evaluations. I'll move myself down. Let's see where can I move myself so you can kind of see what this says. So. Um, so what you can see here is we have our task conditions here and our cognitive conditions. So this is kind of what the task is and how I feel about the task. Um, we have our external evaluations. Um, we have the different components of the task within our cognitive system. And we have our performance at the end. So let's take a deeper dive here. Um, OK, so if I do that, let's see, deeper dive. So we have our products, and um, this is um, really, and with everything that we do, we have to go through this process of defining the task, making goals and plans, um, figuring out how we're going to, what tactics we're going to use, and then adapting those tactics. Um, and we do that um, with the facets of our task. Um, so for each task, there's different facets, and it, it follows this acronym COPES. So the first one is a C for conditions. Up here are the conditions of the task, the things that are external to us. We also have O, the operations, how we're going to um, approach the task. We have the products, um, our cognitive evaluations of that product and our ability to do that, and the standards that we're going to hold ourselves against to know if we've met that standard. And that leads us to our performance. And all of this is really how we're monitoring the task. So all of this, all of these pieces are how we are monitoring the task and leading to our own performance. And it's all influenced also by these external ex evaluations of how other people are evaluating our tasks as well. So you can kind of see how all of these things are related to um to our con to our both our task conditions our cognitive conditions of the task related to our products and it's all interconnected um Pentrix motivational um mo model looks at the four phases of motivation um in these four areas for regulation so the first one is our forethought planning and activation so remember that that's really similar to the first theory we looked at right we have this forethought phase where we're planning um, our tasks. In the cognition area, we're setting goals um, and knowledge activation. We're thinking about what we know. Um, we're motivated by our goals, um, our adoption of whether or not we're thinking about our performance um, or our comparison to others, um, our judgments of, of our efficacy in completing, our task value, our interest, right? And we have our behaviors, the time and effort we're putting into planning. Um, we're planning also for our self-observations here. And we're perceiving the context of the environment for which we will be doing this task. Then we're monitoring our progress um, throughout the task. So we're aware 
of our cognition, we're aware of our affect and motivation, we're aware of our effort, time, our need for help, and we're monitoring um, our, the context that might be changing throughout the task. Then we're, we're taking control. We're, um, in our cognition, we're selecting and adapting our strategies for learning as we go through the task. And we're also selecting and adapting our strategies for motivation. We're observing our behavior and adjusting our effort. And then we're changing and renegotiating the task. We might even be choosing to leave um, or change the context for which we're doing the task. And then finally, we're reacting and reflecting it after we complete the task. We're making um, judgments about the attribution. So do we think that this was our fault or our teacher's fault or was it luck, right? Um, we're having um, an emotional reaction, uh, motivation and attributions to our task. Um, we might be giving up or seeking help um, or our choice behavior. Um, and we are, again, choosing to evaluate, we're evaluating the task, we might be leaving the contacts, we're evaluating the contacts about what we might do in the future. So this motivational model is really our individual attempt to control our, our own overt behavior. So self-regulation is really about how we're motivated to change our behavior. Um, now we'll talk about ELF guides, metacognitive and affective model. So we call this the Maslow model. And it's really looking at um, how our affect um, relates to our metacognitive perspectives, which has really been a part of a lot of these, but I really want to look at this a little more closely. So we have person level tasks, um, which really this top part up here, so we have this task that's influencing both of these. And this first one is, is our general abilities here. Um, and it is a um, top down approach. So we have the task and it's coming down to us. Um, and we're thinking about how our self-concept um, and our ability, our control beliefs, so how, what we believe about who is responsible for, um, for the outcome, um, our affect, and then um, MK is our metacognitive knowledge and MS is our metacognitive skills. So how much we are able to know about what we know and how much we're able to influence that. Um, all interact, and you can see all of these relationships are, um, are reciprocal. So they all affect each other, right? Um, and then the task person level is really, task by person level, it's really um, influenced by the task. So how does the task influence the way that all of these things interact? It's really the micro, micro level, and it's a bottom up. So it's about the task itself and going up to the person. So, um, we have task repet um, repetition, so our monitoring control um, and our ability to, um, to, to affect um, how our metacognition affects our affect and our effort. Um, we have the cognitive recognition of that, and then uh, that leads to our performance. So it's really about how the task, each task individually, um, will react to you differently depending on the context of that task, depending on how it affects our affect. And I think that that's what Elfkite here is really thinking about is, is the inner react, inner relatedness between those two things. And finally, we have Hadwin, Harvella, and Miller's socially shared regulated model of learning, um, which it's really talking about how when we have self-regulated learning, we're not doing this all the time by ourselves, but but in a context of other people and that social aspect, which I think is is a really interesting take on this model. So we have um, our own SRL, our own self-regulated learning, which talks about how we perceive tasks, our goals and plans, our strategies, our adaptations to that task, um, which deals with our operations, products, evaluation, standards, conditions, all those things we've already talked about, about SRL in general, right? Um, but then we have someone else's. Um, your task perceptions and, and all of those things in, in your own self-regulated learning. And, and sometimes we have this co-regulation where we support each other. So maybe you're studying, you're with a partner, um, one of your friends, and you're, you're co-studying for a test. And so you're saying, well, how are you doing? And, and encouraging your friend and y'all are working temporarily together to support each other's self-regulated learning. Um, where you're you're sharing your goals and plans and you're supporting each other, but you're not really joining. You'll have separate separate things you're trying to do. 
but you're supporting each other in that task. That's called co-regulation. Um, it's like parallel play if you're an early childhood um, person. Um, but then that, but if we combine this even further, we can get to this shared regulation where you're, where we're talking about our task perceptions, our golden plan, um, our task strategies. And that shared regulation happens when you have common goals, when you have, when you're working as a team to complete a common practice and how, and really this model is looking at how does this interact with each other? How do we develop shared regulation um, as part of a cooperative group, as part of a social interaction, and that thinking about the ways in which this shared regulation happens um, naturally in business settings and in schools, and how we as teachers might work to create shared regulation across a classroom or across group projects. Um, and that's really maybe more of the type of regulation that we have um, in the real world, and thinking about how even in your own life, how you might be more motivated to complete tasks when those tasks um, are dependent upon other people or when you're working as a team or a group. Um, so again, that was a whirlwind tour of quite a few different types of, um, of models of self-regulated learning. And really, they all come back to how do we regulate our own learning? How do we take control of the learning that happens? And there are quite a few models here of how those interact and um, the reading this week should also help support that. Um, so what benefits do we have for students in this applications to classroom? Why do we even think about this as, learn as teachers? And um, really, we, we want students to be self-regulated, right? So that they can take control of their learning. If we can teach them how to be self-regulated in their learning, then this is a skill that will take them through college, through graduate school, through their lives, right? That we are not the dispensers of knowledge to them, but that they can learn on their own, that they can take control of that learning when they need to. So when we think about um, IPT and the information processing theory, what types of students will have the most difficulty with self-regulation and metacognition? And that's all happening in this executive control part, this metacognition part up here. And the students who have trouble with executive control processes are gonna have the most difficulty with self-regulation. We know that executive control and that frontal lobe development is one of the last things to develop um, in, in neurocognition. So our, um, are developmentally delayed, our less mature students will have the most difficulty with this self-regulated learning, including students with um, um, disabilities such as um, attention deficit hy hyperactivity disorder and autism might have the most difficulty with self-regulated learning as well. Um, and how, but how can we help all students develop these skills? And again, um, for some students are really excellent achievers, um, might not need as explicit instruction in these tools as well as students who might need really explicit instructions depending on the developmental level that we're teaching. So how do we develop these goals of setting goals, self-reinforcement, self-assessment, and self-observation? And these are the key components of self-regulation no matter what model you're looking at. So how do we get students to do this? Um, we can have them set goals and think about long-term and short-term goals, right? Thinking about what are some things we can accomplish and what are the steps in order to to meet those goals, right? And that helps us with that, that motivation piece as well, right? Um, helping them um, self-observe and be aware of their own actions, which sometimes students are just blissfully unaware of what's happening in their lives, right? So getting them to, to observe themselves and maybe even record what they know. Um, self-assessment, and that's really about calibrating what they see to what the actuality of what they see is, and it's part of that reflective process. So can they accurately assess, according to a set of standards, what they are doing and what they've observed to what is expected? And then self-reinforcement, how do they reward themselves for doing a good job or for um, motivating them internally for a job well done or feeling a sense of satisfaction? Um, now let's talk a little bit about growth mindset. This was um, a theory um, proposed by Carol Dweck. You can see a picture of her. And it's really um, this attribution theory, um, locus of control, goal setting, and motivation. You can see she's published lots of books. This is a very, very popular um, 
theory that is really taken a lot of um, press lately. A lot of school districts are really all about growth mindset. And because it's become so popular in educational circles, I wanted to take a little bit of time today to talk about what the research really says and what it really means um, before we get too carried away with growth mindset. So what is growth mindset? Um, it really talks about kind of two different mindsets um, or theories of intelligence that a, kid, that a child could have. The first one is a fixed mindset, this idea that intelligence is fixed, that I will not get smarter no matter how hard I work, um, that ability is a stable construct. Um, and then the second um, mindset, a growth mindset, believes that, I, that intelligence can grow, that I can get smarter if I work hard. And this is a little tricky, right? Because um, theoretically, actually, intelligence is pretty fixed, right? That, that you're born with some sort of ability, capacity to learn, right? Um, so I don't really, I, I am going to quibble with the language here a little bit. And, and I think that while our capacity might be limited, our, our intelligence, our ability might be limited, um, I don't think that our achievement is necessarily fixed, right? That I can become better at math if I work hard. I can become a better artist if I practice. I can become a better piano player if I practice. And that's true for everyone. Now, I could practice every day for 20 hours and still never become a master musician, right? I, I don't have a lot of talent in music, but I will become a better piano player if I practice. And that's true for everyone, right? I may never become a brilliant mathematician, but if I practice at math and I work at math, I will get better at math. I will get better at reading if I practice reading. And that's what a growth mindset's probably really about is I can get better at something if I practice at it. Um, that was fun. So that's a growth mindset. Um, and what we Dweck studies really showed in a controlled setting, so in like a laboratory setting where she brought in people to, to do something in a laboratory controlled, you know, controlled group, um, intervention group kind of thing, she found that students with a growth mindset, students who believe that they could get better at something if they practiced, um, spent more time persisting on difficult work, that they, they would take longer to do something to ultimately become successful at something if they worked harder at it, right? Um, whereas um, students with a fixed mindset would give up more easily and not ultimately be successful at the task. Um, then she found that she could do an intervention and teach growth mindset so that she could take people with a fixed mindset and turn them to have a growth mindset by teaching them about growth mindset, by giving them a growth mindset, by doing an intervention. And then those students who had that intervention done, who adopted a growth mindset, then when she gave them that task again that was difficult, they would persist longer on that difficult work and ultimately become successful. So the idea here is that Dweck, what Dweck found was that having a growth mindset um, produced successful things in a class and um, for students that they would they would persist longer and be ultimately successful in hard tasks, hard academic tasks, and that we could teach people to have a growth mindset. That this was a, a factor we could change about people, and then even when we when we change that, that then they would have success. So that's really positive, and and we can see why school districts, you know. Um, all of a sudden got really excited about this and are all about growth mindsets. Let's teach our kids how to have growth mindsets. Let's teach our students to, to, um, to believe that they can get better at things if we work hard. And that sounds really, really great, right? That sounds like something that schools should be all about, that teachers should do, right? Um, but there's some things to keep in mind here. Um, the first one being, let's see, um, the first one being on my arrows, um, that when we tried to do some replication studies, right? So, so a key to good science is that when one researcher finds something, that other researchers should try to replicate that study. So in a more naturalistic, real-world setting. So now let's go to classrooms. Let's go to real-life, real-world classrooms with actual children, not in lab settings. And what we found was that when teachers um, implement growth mindset interventions in a real classroom, that really there was there was a small change in student achievement, but it was really negligible. It was really, really, really tiny for improving students' actual GPAs, um, actual grades um, by doing this growth mindset. And really, and part of that might be is that no one really teaches fixed mindset. No one in the entire, no, there, there's very few teachers in the world who are gonna say, well, you know, 
it's not going to matter how much you practice that math. You know, you're not going to get any better at it. No, that, that's really not an intervention. That, that's not real. So, so an emphasis on growth mindset, really and truly, we're probably doing a lot of that anyway, which is probably a good thing, right? But, but, but a huge focus on growth mindset then isn't going to make a huge difference in schools, probably in the real world. Um, so should this be, basically schools wanted to make or want to make growth mindset to be this panacea, this magic bullet, this pill that's going to change the way schools work and that it's just going to solve all of our achievement problems if we can just convince kids if they work hard, they'll do great and they'll achieve at high levels. And I think there might be some problems with that, right? Um, one is that there are some real intellectual differences between kids. And if we ignore those and just say, if you work really hard, you'll do better. It's not that kids, all kids will do better, but they all can't achieve the same levels. And that if we ignore the real differences between kids, that we're probably setting them up for failure and that we probably need to provide more supports as well. It's not all about hard work. It's also about the supports that we can provide for students and knowing that not all kids learn at the same speed. Um, so it could turn into a, well, you're just not working hard enough um, for a student who has a real um, intellectual or um, developmental disability um, or processing disorder, um, working harder, they're still not going to learn as fast, right? Um, but I do think it's important to know that every kid can get better. So that, that message, there's some nuance to the language that might be missing from a full tilt growth mindset um, approach, right? Um, and it just might not have the huge benefits that school districts might be touting, right? Um, I heard um, a professional development that said growth mindset is the single most important factor in student achievement. And I'm like, that, the research just doesn't support that, right? Um, things like socioeconomic status um, and, and IQ are actually way more important to achievement than growth mindset. So we just want to be careful with our claims, perhaps. In any case, I'm, um, I want you to think about the role that um, growth mindset should have um, in schools um, and consider that for your own, your own practice. And as you hear growth mindset in schools, what do you, what do you think? How do you think schools and teachers should be handling growth mindset? Um, so what role do you think it should have in school curriculum and for teachers? And how will you approach it as a teacher when this is the professional development that you'll be asked to do? So um, as you think about these questions, um, you should be able to, to list some models of self-regulation and talk about how that applies to your practice as a teacher. Um, you can talk about how self-regulation and growth mindset are related um, and what the research is to support growth mindset theory. So I hope you have a great week. Again, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to ask me, call me, send me an email. I'm happy to answer your questions and have a great week, guys. Bye.